uh, some water, and that should get rid of a lot of the salt. For James so, Tour, the journey to becoming a distinguished chemist and world-renowned researcher in nanotechnology was an unusual one. I wanted to become a New York State trooper, and uh, I couldn't get into the academy because I was colorblind. What I did is I set out to go into forensic science, and my father said, why don't you just study chemistry in general, and you could specialize after, after that, which was good advice. After graduating and working as an assistant professor, James made an incredible breakthrough in molecular electronics. It came after reading an article in a science journal. In that article, there was a molecule that was uh, built as a, as a perpendicular type of structure. And it came out of IBM, and they said that this could be a switching device if anybody could make it. So I thought it would be a good, a, a good thing to practice making, and so we, we ended up making it. And then I was contacted by Scientific American, and they said, uh, we've learned that you've just made the, the most difficult molecule ever synthesized. But I realized that if we took our tools of organic synthesis and moved into other areas where they were not familiar with synthesis, we could have a huge impact. It was this outstanding achievement that eventually led him to Rice University, now a professor of chemistry, computer science, mechanical engineering, and material science at the Smalley Institute for Nanoscale Science. James' research in nanotechnology is equally groundbreaking. What we're doing is we're programming molecular computers. That was a project that we were involved in, and that we try to understand the chemistry that goes on in the actual hardware, the switches. For example, we have an area in nano machines where we build nano cars, where we can park 50,000 of these across the diameter of a human hair. So they're very, very small. They're about two nanometers by three nanometers. But these are the size structures, the size domains that we can begin to consider. And then we try to monitor and watch these move across a surface, learn how to pick things up and move them, because ultimately what's done is if you want to do bottom-up construction, uh, much like, like is done in all of biological systems. Everything is done from the bottom up. This is the way that God has decided to construct things. In 100 years or 200 years, we'll see buildings built this way, where we'll just bring in basic raw materials and little nanomachines will begin to build a structure and you'll see it go up just as, as, as blades of grass grow, the structure will, will assemble. Okay, and so these are hollow? Yes. And what do you want to do with this? Among the numerous applications derived from the work of James and his research team is the creation of carbon nano vectors for medical treatments. So we have these nanoparticles that we call hydrophilic carbon clusters. And what these can do is we can target them to certain cell types using typical targeting schemes. So it can go and find the cell of interest if you wanted to go to a cancer cell, for example. But in the face of trauma, a superoxide forms in excess and it starts attacking good tissue. So what we do is we, we made these carbon nanoparticles that will react with that superoxide and decompose the superoxide. And so that's what it was designed for and it, it actually works quite well. In addition to this, James has had over 350 research papers published in academic journals, becoming one of the top 10 cited authors in the world since 2000. For all his success, he keeps dreaming of more. I'd love to see some of the medications, the nanomaterials that we're using for, for medicine be ultimately used uh, to benefit people. We have projects related to pancreatic cancer and different cancer types, and, and uh, I see people suffering from that. I'd like to, to see that used. But the best treasure we have, it's like in any field, the best thing that we have is, is the people. It's, it's the, the people that we work with and seeing them go out because that's what will really outlast me as we train these students and see them go forward. Jim Tour is perhaps the most intense person I have ever known. He's intense about chemistry. He's intense about his family. He's intense about his research. He's intense about his students. He's intense about working out. Uh, everything with him is 
like 100%. The intensity begins at 3.30 a.m. each morning as James spends two hours reading his Bible and praying before heading out to the gym for his 90-minute workout. It's a regiment that has been his life for more than 30 years. But it wasn't always this way. Growing up in a secular Jewish home, James never gave God a second thought. It wasn't until his college years that a conversation with a young man about the Bible changed the course of his life. So then he showed me a verse where Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust for her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. And I was deeply convicted by that. I was addicted to pornography. I was only 18 years old at the time. And then he showed me other verses where Jesus died for my sin. I didn't even know that there was a claim on the table that Jesus died for me. That was not something that we discussed. And then he talked about how I can get to God through this man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for me. A few months later, after studying the Bible, James made an important decision. On November 7th, 1977, I was all alone in my room. And I got down on my knees, and I asked the Lord to forgive me and to come into my life. And all of a sudden, this burden that I had been carrying since the young man shared with me about my sin just started to lift. And I felt the presence of God so strongly filling the room. His presence was so vivid, and I was being drawn. And I didn't want to get up, and I just started weeping. The experience left him deeply changed. James soon joined a nearby church. It was here that he met his future wife at a potluck supper. Went in to do the dishes, and she was already doing them. My heart just leapt out of my chest. It just started pounding like Popeye. So I just stood there and dried the dishes that she was doing. And then I started to notice how beautiful she was and how gracious she was. Married now for 31 years and parents of four children, ages 17 to 29, they have modeled a strong faith in God. I wake up very early in the morning, kneeling at the bottom of the steps, reading my Bible, and the Lord speaks to me through the scriptures. I learn so much about how to gauge my life, how to work with people, how to respect people, how to honor things, and how to do what is right. Like many couples, James and Shireen have overcome struggles in their relationship, but their love and commitment to each other has withstood the test. Then they go up one more step and they read Psalm 122. You know, people just see him as an intense person working very hard, but he has a very tender heart. Even when big things hit, you can just see her, she's just going to go back to the Lord. And she opens up her Bible, which is underlined everywhere, everywhere. And just, she is a rock, an absolute rock. And that deep faith has led them to open their home to many each week for meals and conversation. They have helped connect the university students into the life of the church. They've challenged them to serve the body of Christ. Uh, they literally feed, have everyone to their home on Sunday afternoons for special lunches. If you're a young person and you're there to feel loved or be at a home, especially for these lunches, he just knows how to reach out to young people specifically and make them feel loved and wanted. James lives out his faith in every aspect of his life. It's a personal relationship where I'm bringing God into my work. And I break at noontime and I pray over each of my projects and I pray over each of the students. I have a list of the, the students on my smartphone and I just pray for each one working in the lab and their projects. Revolutionizing the world with his research in nanotechnology isn't the only legacy James is leaving. He is so involved in God's Word. He, he meditates on it, he studies it, he reads it. He doesn't use any helps. He just does it on his own. 
and asks God to show him what he wants him to know. And that has really rubbed off on me. He's humble, and if you have any questions about the Bible, the scriptures, I think he's the right person to come and ask. I love his discipline. I love his commitment. And, and he knows that the first thing in his life is his relationship with God. That's number one. And it comes out very clear. We all work extremely hard. Our hours are very long. I'll get emails from Jim in the middle of the night. But when it's dinner time and he's meeting with his family, basically meetings are over and he goes home. And I think that's just a you know, fantastic quality that he has. We deal with a lot of cancer patients that we like to help. He would just go get on his knees at the in the hospital. He'd just sit there and just cry and pray over them. I don't have many goals, but I have a few. And I have a goal to share Jesus Christ with many people around me and impact them for Jesus.